Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this hour, this hour that you've given just for us. We pray that we, would, we will be good stewards of the time that you've given us. And that we would be submissive to your leading and guiding of your Holy Spirit. We pray now that you would hide me behind your cross. That your people will hear your words in spite of what I may do or say. We're thankful for this opportunity and this honor, this privilege to share in your word. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. 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 I was going to play a song that the OJs, I don't know if anyone here remember that group, the OJs. Uh, all right. Right. Football player, OJ? <laughs> <laughs> Not that OJ. It, it, it was a singing group called the OJ, led by Eddie Levert. And they had this song, a very popular song, For the Love of Money. For the Love of Money. For the Love of Money, folk would do strange things. Things that are unheard of. They will do just about anything for the love of money. We want to talk about a choice that the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, the 13th verse in particular, is taken from the NIV version. It reads like this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or wealth or things, or people, or any of the trappings of this world. You cannot serve both God and money. There are four additional verses that I would like for those who are taking notes to keep in mind or write down. The first one that goes along with this verse 13 of the 16th chapter of Luke is 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, the 10th verse. Then we would have Matthew, the 6th chapter, the 33rd verse. Then Luke, the 12th chapter, a portion of the 33rd verse and the 34th verse. And Joshua, chapter 24, verse 15. And if we were to string together these passages of scripture, I think it would succinctly state our thesis or the meaning. If you don't get anything else that is said this morning, just remember these verses. And I will read these verses, put together, to make a statement. They are all a part of the new international version of the translation of the Bible, and I will read it thusly. Again, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Joshua 24, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. Amen. 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 Hopefully you got that. And if it was any other team kicking off at 12 o'clock, we would probably end and say the benediction. But we want to talk about, just for a few minutes, <laughs> Luke's, Dr. Luke's prescription for a healthy Christian life, and that is making a wise choice of master making a wise choice of master. Certainly, if we're going to be healthy Christians, we need to make wise choices in this life. And the best choice an individual can make is that of whom they will serve. And hopefully that choice, by our Christian experience, that person will come to know that that best choice is God. However, this particular passage is very difficult to understand because it is a passage of scripture, it is a parable that Jesus told that is a parable of contrast about a dishonest or shrewd steward whose dealings and actions demonstrate on how the world does business with itself such as you've heard terms of golden parachutes nest egging networking, politicking, scratching each other's back, etc., etc. This is how the world does business. And those who do it wisely or shrewdly are commended. Those who do the business of this world have learned the business tricks, the do's and the don'ts, on how to be profitable, on how to be successful. We would call them the children of the world because they have that zeal, they have that passion for success, and they will do most anything to get ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. Shrewdness, the word shrewdness means being astute or mentally sharp in practical matters. Cunning, wise, prudent, clever, and getting ahead. And certainly the children of this world are wise on how to get ahead. But we Christians are not so wise when it comes down to our work in the world. And Jesus is saying here, if 
We were just as passionate, just as wise, just as clever about doing our work in terms of evangelism, of ministry, of sharing. If we were had that zeal, that passion that the children of this world has for their work, if we had that for our work, then oh, what a different world we would live in. We, as Christians, would make the difference on whether or not there would be peace in this world, whether or not there would be justice in this world, true and lasting justice. Whether or not there would be true and honest fellowship and love in this world, we would make the difference. Certainly, this manager of the rich man's property shows us how the dealings of this world may be profitable to those business practices or those who are practicing business. How the strategy that this dishonest man had so that he could have a parachute, a golden parachute. He was about to get fired, he knew it, because he mismanaged his master's property. So he wanted a golden parachute. He wanted a place to land. So therefore he made deals with the debtors. That pleased them, of course. So when he was fired, when he was laid off, when he was let go, he would have a place to go. That's, that's wise. We should take note of that. By contrast, we should network within ourselves. We should form alliances with ourselves, with other Christians, on how best to do the Lord's work. We are one local church here. And we can't do all of God's work alone. We need all of the body of Christ, all of the local churches, working together to deliver a consistent and concise message of salvation. And we should engage ourselves with our activities with other churches to ensure that the word of God is spread throughout the community. Whether it be Presbyterian, Catholic, Baptist, we as a United Methodist Church should be open to partnering with any of the other bodies of Christ, local bodies of Christ, in order to facilitate God's work. We need to put our heads together on how best we can feed the hungry, how best we can clean up our streets, how best to go about worshiping and praising God. We cannot be close-minded and say that this is a church in and of itself. God's church is a universal church, and he expects his church to behave in such a way that we are inclusive of all those people who need help, and certainly we all need help. So we should be shrewd, we should be wise, just like this dishonest steward, we should be just as wise, just as cunning, just as prudent to look for ways on how best to further God's kingdom. Hmm. Hmm. But we're talking about the love of money. The love of something other than God. And ultimately, whether we choose something other than God as our master, or whether we choose to serve God as our master. Many people would say they love God, but 
the service of money proves otherwise. The service of money. And money is representative of anything that is not God. When we choose to worship or serve anything other than God, we stand in a pathway, a slippery slope that leads to idolatry. But many people would say that they love God, but their service, their actions, their behavior demonstrates something else. So how can we tell who or what we are serving? How can you tell about yourself? How can I tell about myself on whether or not I'm serving God or something or someone other than God? We can keep this principle in mind that will help us answer this question. The servant will sacrifice for his or her God. I will repeat that. The servant will sacrifice for his or her God. If you will sacrifice for the sake of money, but will not sacrifice for the sake of Jesus Christ, then let us not deceive ourselves. Money is your God. Again, if you sacrifice for money and do not sacrifice for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then your choice is quite evident. It is that of money. It is something other than God. And we should keep this top of mind on what, who we are sacrificing for. What are we giving of our time, our efforts, our devotion, What are we giving our energies to? And if it's not Jesus Christ, then it could be considered as wealth or money, the comforts of this life. Don't get it twisted that God does not want us to enjoy these things in life of which he has provided. Everything God has made is good. Everything. And it is for our benefit. <clears throat> but when we put our time and energy towards those things in life, towards making money, being successful in life, making friends, whatever it may be, then we stand of making a choice of whom we serve or what we serve that is other than God. You may say, hmm, well, I'm not rich. I can barely make ends meet. I'm so happy when the first of the month comes and when the 15th of the month comes. So therefore, the preacher is not talking about me because I'm not rich. Again, don't deceive yourself. The poor can be just as greedy and just as covetous of money as those who may be quote unquote rich. You see, it becomes ultimately a matter of the heart. matter that God judges our hearts, whether 
or not we are given to or devoted to things instead of him. Whether or not we call money our master, whether or not we call position our master, whether we are called our homes our master, whether or not we call those things other than God our master. God knows our hearts. He judges our hearts. Those things which men think are esteemed and place high value on, God does not see those things as high value. He looks at whether or not our hearts are devoted to him, whether or not our allegiance are devoted to him, whether or not our servanthood is devoted to him. He sees whether or not we possess things or whether things possess us. Things, things, things such as wealth, money, fame, prestige, stuff. Whether or not they possess us. These things, things, wealth, money, homes, they can possess us. We can get carried away with our worship and devotion to these things. And Luke is giving us a prescription that if you choose things instead of God, it is not a wise decision. Because those things, people, position, prestige, Money are but resources. They are not the source. So we have, as Joshua puts it, are you going to serve resources? Or are you going to serve the Lord who is the source? Make a wise decision. Are you going to serve things that will fade away? Or are you going to make a choice of the Lord God Almighty? Are you going to choose servitude towards things that will ultimately give way, that will ultimately fail, that will ultimately let you down, or are you going to choose wisely your master as the Lord God Almighty? Then what then should be your choice? What then should be my choice. What then should be a dying world's choice of master? Should it be that of gold and silver? Should it be that of some man or woman? Should it be that of some position in an organization or should it be our Lord God? Whom do you call master? Whom do you bow down to and worship every day? How can we, who claim God as our master, impact the world and how the world does business, how the world behaves because they see something in us and how we have claimed our master. I don't know about you, but my master 
has no comparison. My master speaks, and the world, and the universe, and everything that dwelleth in it comes into existence. My master can open red seas for us. My master will be in the fire with us. My master can shut lion's mouths for us. My master can heal. My master can deliver. My master can save me. My master went to Calvary's cross and died for me. My master died for me. My master was resurrected for me. My master sits on the right hand of God for me. My master will come back for me. What about your master? What about your choices? Can your master do what the master of the sea can do? Can your master breathe on you and give you life? Can money do this? No, no. Can prestige do this? No, no. Then why would you choose anything else but my master? Amen. Christ is head of the church, and he is our master. Amen. A master that loves the church, that serves the church, that covers the church, that holds the church, that leads the church, that guides the church, that empowers the church, that enables the church to withstand even death itself, that the gates of hell will not prevail against my master's church. Is the Lord your master? It's the Lord your master. It's the Lord your master. Amen. He is the master. And I would implore anyone who has not made the choice of masters, take Dr. Luke's prescription. Choose wisely. Choose the everlasting God. Choose Jehovah Jireh. Choose Jehovah Rapha. Choose Jehovah Nisi. Choose Yahweh. Choose Jesus as your master. And when you make that choice, I chose the master, and the master mastered me. And you will have made a wise choice of master. Amen. Amen.